Thank you, everybody. Thank you and welcome to this debate on global challenges and the future of business schools. Uh, my name is Michael Kitson and I'm joined by three deans of Cambridge Judge Business School who will discuss these important topics. We're here uh, today at the Cambridge Union, which is a training ground for many politicians. Uh, and debate normally in this union is a, takes a really confrontational format. Um, but today, we'll be, I'm sure we're going to have a much more constructive dialogue. Um, as well as the audience we are in here in the Cambridge Union, we've got the current MBAs, which we're welcome to see here at the Cambridge Union. And we're also joined by the wider members of the Cambridge Judge Business School community via Zoom and YouTube. So welcome to everybody, uh, if you're here virtually or here in, in reality. So the discussion today will look at global challenges. We are living in interesting and difficult times. The, wor the world is still in the embrace of the COVID pandemic and the uneven path of recovery illustrates the structural inequalities in the world economy. So although our immediate concern is the pandemic, there are other major long-term challenges facing the global society including climate change, demographic shifts, such as population aging, inequality, and technological change. So to discuss these challenges and their implications for business schools, we have a panel comprising three deans of the Cambridge Judge Business School. Uh, first of all, we have Professor Christoph Locke, who is the current director of the Cambridge Judge Business School. Uh, Christoph was the director from 2011 and will end his tenure in August this year. We have Professor Sandra Dawson, who is the director of the Cambridge Judge Business School from uh, 1995 to 2006. And last but certainly not, not least, uh, Professor Mara Guillen, who is a professor at Wharton, but who is the director of LECT of the Cambridge Judge Business School, who will take up this position in September this year. So join me in welcoming him, the three deans. Now we have a big topic to discuss global challenges and the implications of business schools. We'll be talking about this for about 40, 45 minutes to allow time for questions from the audience and from those people joining us via Zoom. Um, so a big topic, but perhaps we'll kick off with, you know, asking the deans individually what they think are the major challenges facing global economy and the global society now. So the major long term challenges. So I'm going to kick off with Christoph. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's nice to see you all here and hello to everybody who is here on Zoom. Thank you. Um, I think there are two things uh, which are overriding. Uh, one of them is uh, sustainability and climate change. Um, uh, yeah, this is not about uh, the temperature in England becoming a bit warmer uh, you know, over the next few years. This is about large parts of the world becoming uninhabitable and once two billion people need to move uh, because they can't live anymore where they live. Uh, uh, this uh, is, is really uh, existential. Uh, I think that is one challenge. Uh, and the second challenge is inequality. Uh, inequality is already uh, leading to uh, globalization being questioned, uh, uh, structures of society being questioned. Uh, and I think that's the second challenge. And I think that is as essential. Um, and uh, everything else, like we are facing new technologies that we need to manage, uh, we need to manage uh, diversity in our own organizations. All of that is important, but it pales in comparison to these two challenges. And these two challenges cannot be solved by businesses alone. Uh, society and governments uh, need to play a lead role, but businesses absolutely must step up and make a contribution. Thank you, Christoph. Sandra. Climate change, one, two, three, and four. Not, as Christoph says, because of any national concerns or even European concerns or even concerns of the global north, because it is our world. It's the air we breathe. It's the food we eat. It's the water we drink. It's our planet. And whilst it looks long term and whilst it's been going on, you could argue since the Industrial Revolution, um, action now for 2025, for 2050, it's absolutely essential. And as Christoph says, it's essential in businesses, large and small. It's essential in communities and it's essential in governments. And that leads me to my second challenge, which is cooperation. How on earth are we going to get the sort of multilateral cooperation which joins the global north and the global south, which sees that this is one planet and in which business and all of you are going to properly play your role within a capitalist economy, within the profitability, within sustainability, 
to ensure that our planet survives and our children and our grandchildren have indeed businesses to go with. So I say climate change and um, cooperation across all the boundaries that we can think of. Mara. So uh, in addition to the three, I believe, uh, that have been mentioned, let me just, uh, by the way, first say thank you for organizing and uh, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, but what I would say is uh, for me, uh, the word global has two meanings. So one is the geographical meaning of it. And the other one is global in the sense that it affects every facet of life. And I think both Christoph and Sandra were speaking to that as well. Uh, so the two that I would like to add is one, the attack on liberalism uh, as an idea, uh, both in the realm of politics and uh, also individual freedoms, and uh, as well, uh, the market. Um, as you know, um, we thought that we had won that battle uh, maybe five uh, decades ago or so, but uh, apparently uh, we're back at it, right? And uh, I think this is uh, uh, really problematic because I am uh, uh, really uh, concerned about um, um, how this may um, be counterproductive in the future. The fact that so many people are these days um, shying away from liberalism. And for somebody who was uh, born and raised in a dictatorship, I can tell you that it's no fun uh, to be in those situations. Um, so um, I think that's a big challenge. Uh, and uh, too many people are taking it lightly as if, um, you know, uh, it weren't important. The second one that I would add, uh, perhaps uh, as a uh, compliment to uh, what you both said is waste as a global problem. Um, we have a kind of economy uh, and perhaps also a kind of um, business um, environment that is conducive to waste, right? Um, containers uh, of food or other stuff that you can buy at the supermarket get bigger and bigger. Because uh, marketers um, persuade us that it's better if we buy a bigger container and then, of course, much of it goes to waste. And uh, I think the problem of sustainability is just being compounded by the issue that uh, we've gotten ourselves somehow into a situation in which waste is just rampant in the world. And of course, that aggravates every other problem, especially sustainability, but so many others as well. Thank you. If, if we focus on climate and sustainability as, as two related issues, and I, I have to say that the, the poll we've done of MBA students, current MBA students, climate came out as number one uh, by far in terms of global challenges. Um, what are we actually going to do about it? I mean, uh, how do we solve this problem? I mean, we, we've known about climate change for a long, long time. It's, 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 it's been a, since the 1950s and 60s, people have been talking about the importance of climate change, but we haven't dealt with it so far. What do we do about it? And does it mean that some economies are gonna to have to have slower growth? Is that a price worth paying to deal with it? Christoph. I'll take a cut. Uh, and I won't answer this uh, at a technical level. Um, I make the following observation. Whenever decisions about climate change and sustainability are being discussed, they're discussed in the spirit of Oh, and there's yet another constraint that you are placing on us. We have all of these constraints and now we can't do this, we can't do that because now we can't, uh, you know, emissions. And so it, you, you're just placing even more constraint on my stressed organization. And the government says this, Boris Johnson says it, uh, and companies are arguing this and they're saying, if you put this constraint on me, then I am competing with another company in another country, which is less regulated and they're not under these constraints and you are just, and our knees are buckling. And I think that is fundamentally a view which is preventing us uh, from actually going to the solutions. Because this is all a huge also an opportunity uh, if we don't view this as constraints, but we are saying, look, we're making enough stuff um, we have enough services. Um, if we're willing to pay for better water, for better air, uh, you know, which people are willing for better health, um, then there are opportunities to create employment, there are opportunities to create wealth. If we reconceptualize this, and this is going to be very complicated, right? But then we can become solution oriented uh, and we can start going forward rather than sitting there whining and complaining about constraints that anybody, uh, people are putting on us. And as long as governments are not able to switch in saying we are rebuilding the economy for a positively, uh, you know, march forward like the Marshall Plan after the Second World War, uh, we will not be able to solve it. It's a, it's a mindset. Uh, and, the, and, and a willingness and, and motivation to go for opportunities. And we're missing it. And as long as we're missing that, 
uh, we will not find the solutions at the speed that we need to. Sandra. Well, I, yes, I agree with that very much. You have to, you have to believe that it's the right thing to do to look at the future of your companies. If you're um, on the board of a company, you have to believe that it's not good enough to look at next quarter, next year, next five years, that you've got to look at 25 years or 30 years and think about your supply chains and think about uh, the uh, extraordinary disruptions that will happen. And that could give you a sort of business reason why you should take a longer term view and you should focus on it. But to me, the business reason is not going to be sufficient because there will always be other priorities. It's got to be a fundamental uh, belief. And then as soon as Christoph says you switch the mindset, then the opportunities, for example, um, in agriculture, by then harnessing new technology, using artificial intelligence, using data, um, using um, digital um, analytics, you can suddenly look at your production processes and your um, uh, marketing uh, plan in a completely different way. And um, I think one of the problems is, which in a way we've seen with COVID is that even people who sort of get it then feel beleaguered by the present day. And so I think an enormous challenge is to make sure that you, of course, you've got to focus on the present day. You can't have your business going out of business in a year, but you also have to make sure that you've got a really good horizon sense and that you're really looking into the future of what your business is going to be. And there isn't actually, if you take your risk analysis seriously and you really do uh, the analytics, there really isn't a business that can say it's immune to climate change, regardless of what governments do. And But the, you need to put the focus on these twin, the horizon and and if you like the present short term, and we have far too much on the short term, which we can understand in terms of the mindsets sometimes of investors, but they're changing, the mindsets of boards, but they're changing, but above all the mindsets of all of you who are going into businesses now or into governments, because you're going to have the choice of where you work. And you're going to go and naturally go to those which you think have got a sustainable future. So actually all these different pressures, um, the, the, the new recruits, the, um, uh, the investors, the pension funds, there is the beginning. And we've just got to keep up the pressure to say, what's that horizon like? Um, because if the horizon, in which we carry on with the present emissions, waste, um, uh, and greenhouse gases, we carry on in that way. And as I say, the air where we breathe is going to become uh, very unpleasant. Mara. So I think, I think business has a uh, very important role to play in at least uh, three respects. So one is, I think businesses around the world should put more pressure on governments to accomplish something that Sandra uh, referred to earlier, which is cooperation. And we have a deficit of cooperation among governments in the world right now, triggered by the um, United States perhaps uh, four or five years ago. But I think businesses should, um, in the spirit of thinking about the long term, and put pr pressure on politicians. You know, politicians have a very short time horizon. We frequently say that businesses have a short time horizon, but politicians have the time horizon of the next election, right? Or the next time that they have to uh, essentially compete uh, to maintain power. A second thing that I would mention, I think uh, really important as well is um, for businesses to set ambitious goals. So over the last few weeks, uh, several automobile companies or months uh, have committed to electric vehicles. Uh, I'm not here endorsing electric vehicles as a solution, but what I'm saying is that they've set a very ambitious goal. And these are companies that were founded in some cases more than hundred years ago. Uh, so they've been doing business uh, on the basis of the internal combustion engine, right? For the last hundred years. And now they're saying, we're gonna switch to electric. So several German companies, American firms, and I believe also Japanese over the last uh, months or so. Right? Kicking and screaming. Yeah, exactly. I'm saying it kicking and screaming. Exactly. So, so I think uh, that would be it. Now the third one, and here I'm going to be, I don't, I don't want to be sound, to sound critical about business, but I think uh, many businesses um, have been all too eager uh, in this, uh, for example, in the energy transition to take subsidies from governments. And uh, I'm okay with subsidies as long as they don't subsidize production, as long as they subsidize innovation. Because the problem when you subsidize production, and then again, businesses are willing to take whatever the government, you know, incent, uh, all of the incentives. 
is that then uh, you could be uh, encouraging the use of technologies that are not yet the best or that um, you know are not uh, fully competitive with, for example, uh, coal or, or other similar energy sources. And this has been a big problem in some countries around the world, including my own country of birth, Spain, uh, where we deployed uh, a lot of wind power, uh, but using technologies that today um, are still relatively um, uncompetitive, right? So we, we jumped too quickly because there was a big incentive. The same happened in the United States, in my view, for example, with corn-based ethanol. Mm -hmm. That was also a, a set of subsidies uh, uh, about the production of ethanol, not about innovation to make ethanol as a source of renewable green energy more efficient in the future. So don't take this as a criticism. I'm just saying that uh, business leaders, I think, should be less quick to um, take advantage of production subsidies and perhaps ask governments uh, to introduce more incentives um, for innovation. Uh, I believe that most incentives, I mean, the role of the government is very, certainly very important, but it should incentivize innovation, not production, right? Because once you start subsidizing production, it's, uh, it's just, uh, you get into a lot of problems, right? Uh, and you may be um, offering a solution to existing problem, but in the process of doing so, you create more, more problems. What about um, renewables, energy, and subsidies for, for renewables? Do you think, what, what role do you think they have? Who, the business or yes, the government? For, for government in interacting with business. I was just thinking about subsidies, which do seem in some ways to drive um, possibly a different energy profile. Yeah. No, I mean, my, again, my view is that I think businesses should fully participate in this. And of course, they have in, in, in virtually every country around the world. But, you know, businesses, not surprisingly, they respond to whatever signals they get from the market and from governments, right? And from society, right? In, in, in many cases. But the problem, I think, has been that they've been too ready, too willing to accept uh, subsidies that I don't think are good for society over the long run. That's, that's my, it's a very specific point that I think has led to very bad outcomes in many cases, right? Uh, just, just to uh, dwell on this example, uh, countries in the world that have uh, overemphasized production subsidies, for example, for green energy, um, have about the highest prices for electricity. And that is like shooting yourself in the foot, because then that hurts your competitiveness. That makes it actually so much harder for companies. So what I'm trying to say is that um, I think businesses should... Um, put pressure on governments, right? Because uh, governments need that kind of pressure, politicians need that kind of pressure, but that they, we sh they should resist it. Oscar Wilde said, I can resist everything but temptation. So they should resist the temptation of taking the easy way, which is to get a subsidy just to produce wind or solar or biomass. That they should take a subsidy to innovate, for, to spend on R&D, right? But not to produce. Because the fact that you offering a subsidy to produce means that whatever technology you're using is not competitive. And then you're essentially reinforcing the, uh, the, um, the old technology, right? That, that needs to get better, but that's not the way to do it. It's to invest in R&D, right? And this is just one example, right? Of how I think business needs to change. But, so yeah. if, if we just widen that out a little bit, I mean, innovation may be a solution to climate change. It may be a solution to, a partial solution to some of these other challenges. I mean, what are the role of government in innovation systems and what are the role of university in innovation systems? And actually, we often um, think about the, the United States as being a free market economy, but in the area of innovation, there's wide scale government intervention. And it has been since the Second World War. That's arguably been very successful in stimulating the innovation system. So the question to all of the panelists, if we think innovation is important, and I think we probably all agree with innovation is important. What are the role of government and what are the role of universities in promoting innovation? Christoph, let you go first. Mara was just. You, you, you keep putting me on the spot. <laughs> like, okay. Um, I've been waiting years to have a chance to put you on the spot. Christoph, Christoph, you're the dean right now. So, uh, <laughs> I can't hide. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think to say that um, innovation is needed, that's a truism. You know, that's very general. Uh, you know, innovation means uh, uh, change, you know, in a, in, a, in a guided direction. That's a. Uh, in, in some sense, trivial. Um, now, uh, governments need to create um, a direction of travel, not only uh, incentives, because incentives will be used by companies in ways um, 
uh, you know, where they're always innovative in how to use the incentives in ways that were not anticipated. Um, uh, but the government needs to set uh, uh, a real direction, uh, you know, where they want to go. Um, and um, uh, governments should um, focus on pre-competitive uh, type of innovation, um, uh, which is difficult to uh, to reap the benefits right away because uh, the innovation on on stuff that you can put into markets now the companies should do uh, you know they shouldn't ask for that from the government um, so governments have a very very important role to play um, and uh, uh, you know this number that uh, the leading economies invest about uh, a little bit more than two percent of the gdp gdp on innovation the government is a smaller part of that mm -hmm. Uh, the rest actually comes from companies because it's uh, you know it's closer to uh, to being able to be put into markets uh, the, and 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 so so without governments uh, this is not going to work. Um, universities have a very important role to play in two ways. Universities do uh, the fundamental pre-competitive innovation. A lot of uh, technologies come out of universities. You see this uh, you know yeah. here in in um, uh, in the Cambridge cluster. You know, as one example of of the uh, university-fed uh, huge innovation clusters like Silicon Valley, like Boston Road 101, like uh, Sophia Antipolis in uh, in France, uh, they they all uh, they grow around universities. So universities create fundamental ideas and technologies, and um, and business schools also create ideas. You, you know, not not in terms of technologies, but in terms of uh, you know ideas and practices. But also another thing that universities do, they create uh, in contact with uh, uh, companies and other organizations, government agencies, you know, charities. Uh, they create knowledge of how to apply this. Um, one mistake that I see made here in Cambridge all the time is that innovation is equated with gadgets. Right, innovation equals technology. That's not true. Technologies by themselves do nothing. Um, they get wasted. Uh, the, the, the change comes from, uh, you know, the daring and the understanding of what it takes to actually turn these technologies into uh, into benefits. And you know, and that's again where the business school has a very important role to play. And that gets overlooked. We see this all the time in the technologists who who come to our accelerator. Uh, uh, you know, and they think, oh, you know, I have a really cool idea, you know, and the rest is going to go by itself. And the answer is no, your technology is worthless. You're not developing a technology, you're creating a business. And if you don't create the business, your technology will at some point uh, collect dust on some shelf. Uh, and that is also something that universities need to do. Thank you. Um, Universities, as Christoph said, are fundamental in the generation of knowledge and ideas. And I think one of the things that's happened, um, I observe in, in some countries, and I think in this country, although we may just have turned a corner, is that there's a lack of trust between the government and the universities. These thoughts that the universities want to pursue their own thing. Well, pursuing their own thing often means really getting down and understanding something which will have huge implications, but there needs to be a lot of freedom to do that. Um, and I, so one can go back to periods when um, this trust, do I trust the generators of knowledge? Do I trust them to be able to actually follow a path that will lead to the latest in artificial intelligence or in data analytics, which are so important? Or do I, do I have to control them? And the truth is that governments have to take quite a deep breath and say, I will trust, and I will give buckets of money that will be competitively bid for, I will try to make it to the best groups of people, and I will try to follow through on that. But that requires a huge deep breath of trust, which is often uh, eroded. I think then the translation of fundamental research um, is is very, very complicated. And uh, it requires the markets and the technology and the people to want to be, uh, to want to work together. Um, and you have to create the ecosystem of all the bits that you will have been looking at in Cambridge for it to be, um, uh, for it to be successful. Um, so, but I think in relation to the pandemic, what we've seen is a, a, a speeding up of the, of, if you like, scientific inquiry through to translational research, right through to the vaccination 
information um, and so on. And, and the very fact that the chief scientist um, has been appearing, providing he keeps his independence, which I think he's trying to do, um, alongside government, and as long as science is seen to have some uh, really independent role, then I think that might help generally, even though it's been forged out of this terrible experience of the pandemic. All right. Well, little less to, to really to add. I mean, I, I'm in complete agreement. I don't think we're having much of a debate here, really. Uh, but the, I think what I would emphasize is the social relationships uh, and how can you maximize those uh, amongst uh, you know, these three sectors, right? So you have the uh, business sector, you have government, uh, and then you have uh, universities or research institutions. Um, and um, one of the things that I've always found fascinating is thinking about how can you maximize collaboration amongst them, other than through funding or project joint projects, but rather, for example, um, helping people rotate in and out from each of those, uh, right? Having porous uh, boundaries uh, among them so that then there can be more intermingling. And of course, co-location matters a great deal. And that's why we have clusters and we have uh, localized ecosystems such as the ones that, that exists here. Uh, so I would emphasize perhaps, you know, adding to what has been said that social relations are really important and fostering those social relationships actually yields uh, great results. I think that's, that's vitally important that, that social relationships and collaboration are very important to the innovation process. And so that's why in Cambridge, colleges are important. It's why the physical space, King's Parade is important. And one of the most important institutions for innovation in Cambridge, I believe, is the pub. So uh, just about 50 yards from us is the Baron of Beef, yeah. where a young scientist met a bank manager called Walter Harriet, that was very crucial in developing the innovation system here. So social interactions, of which we've been starved of for 18 months, are very, very important in innovation processes. Now, before we go on to thinking about business schools, I want to return to one point that, that, that Christoph made at the beginning, which I think is interesting in the context of a business school audience and a business school discussants, is the importance of inequality. Now, inequality was identified amongst the MBA audience here as number two after climate change in terms of their global challenges. I think if we asked that 20 years ago of a business school audience, I'm not sure that inequality will be so highly rated as an area of concern. So I just want to tease a bit about this issue of inequality. There's many dimensions of inequality. Um, and some would say inequality is a price worth paying for successful capitalism. You need inequality to generate incentives. Others might say that inequality has gone a bit too far in certain parts of the world and it's creating this lack of cooperation that affecting social relations what Mara was talking about. So just want to think about why inequality, I think Christoph, you mentioned it's number two or one of your top two. Why is inequality such a big issue? Um, well, if you want um, a sort of a, a quantitative uh, observation, um, there are empirical analyses that say that countries that have a very strong inequality actually are economically less successful and grow less. Um, but that, of course, doesn't explain anything. Um, inequality is fundamentally corrosive um, because it destroys the trust of the population that, uh, you know, we're all in the same boat, right? Um, you know, Andre, uh, you know, has said to me, you know, some people say, we, you know, we're not in the same boat, we're in different boats, right? Once the uh, part of the population sees that, you know, they are the rich people up there, you know, and they have all the opportunities and I'm cut off, um, then uh, why should they be constructive members of society? And then everything from there on crumbles. And that's what you see. That's why we have populism. That's why we have regimes, um, uh, you know, which are uh, spiraling away from, uh, you know, doing things uh, that are in, in the interest of the country. Uh, you get uh, bad behavior, you get, um, uh, you know, parts of the population that are looking for, uh, you know, demagogues in order to do bad things. That's where you get, um, you know, religious extremism. Uh, the, the consensus in society, uh, you know, that we're trying to build something together goes. Um, and that's it. Uh, you know, then, uh, you know, the climate for uh, for successful businesses gets destroyed. And, uh, you know, if you live in gated communities and you think it's fine, um, you're kidding yourself. Sandra, do you think inequality is a big problem? I do. I do. And I, actually, you're saying with the business school 20 years oh, ago, of, 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 I think, 
I do think, and some people will be watching on Zoom, I do think there was a theme about, um, certainly about diversity and about inequality. And so I remember we started the Sainsbury's bursaries for people from the not-for-profit and um, public sector in probably 96. And I remember a new a sort of archetypical stereotypes, a New York banker and a woman who'd run um, the uh, uh, Oxfam office in Afghanistan. And I can remember they came together in Judge Business School and they thought each of them were absolutely terrible. They, would, they could hardly bear to be in the same room uh, because they felt that they had nothing to say to each other. And I think that my biggest, one of my greatest joys about thinking about that year is that by the end of the day, by going through a lot of um, management practice and a lot of difficulty, in the end, there was a mutual respect and an understanding that the way New York finance was working and indeed the way Oxfam was working in Afghanistan, um, both of those things needed to change. And, and the New York banker was just prepared to think about the fact that maybe hugely big salaries and bonuses weren't necessarily a measure of his value um, anymore. And, and whereas he'd entered the room thinking uh, that how could this woman know anything at all because she earned a pittance. So I, I do think it was a theme. I'm very, very personally concerned that in the last 20 years, uh, both nationally and internationally, we've seen this growth in inequality. And I think if understanding how people feel left behind, neglected, um, uh, absolutely humiliated by, if you like, those in power, which probably is the three of us as, on the face of it. Um, really, uh, that's so corrosive and, and it goes generation after generation after generation. And we cannot build successful societies, which means we cannot build successful businesses uh, if we persist in that. If um, So, I, and I think that the, the value of work is another thing, which again, the COVID uh, pandemic has drawn into thing. We have these extraordinary heroic people who are, who are earning just above the minimum wage, who, who will provide our social care uh, in this country. And they do, they are extraordinary. Now, how is it that they are paid so little? Well, of course they're paid so little because it comes out of taxation and we need to rethink um, how we are going to really invest. Uh, but I don't think that's not a sustainable um, uh, future for a society. All right. So just to, uh, again, it seems as if my role here is to complement what they're saying, because I come <laughs> last. So I'm trying always to carve out a niche for myself after, I'm, I'm learning a lot actually from, from the comments, but if I don't want to be repetitive, um, this is what I would say. Let's think for a moment about where this inequality is coming from. What is generating inequality? And every study that I've read, uh, or every study that I've read, which I trust, okay, because there's a lot of crap out there in terms of research on this, on this topic, um, identifies technological change as the main culprit of uh, rising inequality over the last 20 years, technological change. So if, you, if you're gonna point fingers at just one thing, it's not trade, it's not, uh, you know, some of these other things that get discussed here and there, it's technological change. And the problem with technological change these days is that it's mainly affecting people in the middle of the uh, distribution of skills. So people who have low skills, levels of skills, they still have jobs because uh, it's not worth it to automate, it's not worth it to, right? People at the higher end, at least so far, maybe with artificial intelligence, this could change. Uh, they're not being affected as much. So it's in the middle, right? And the problem is that that is destroying jobs that used to pay, um, so I guess in pounds would be maybe 25 pounds an hour, right? Or 30 pounds an hour. And then those people, those jobs disappear. And then those people, they can only find um, another job at, um, a supermarket or at Amazon, uh, but not Amazon programming, but rather, you know, um, in, the, in the warehouse. And so they've lost in terms of wages, they've lost in terms of status and all of that. And that's what I think we haven't um, uh, really thought about. So uh, let me be provocative. Um, I'm sure you pay taxes. Um, you, I, I'm sure you also pay taxes. I pay taxes. I think the robots have to pay taxes. Um, and then with the proceeds, with the revenue from that, uh, then I think we should apply all of the, that funding to um, help uh, people who are displaced by technology. If we don't tackle this, I think now with the next wave, which is gonna be artificial intelligence and all of that, it's gonna be really crazy. I don't think, 
we may have seen the peak yet. That's for me what I find worrisome, right? I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, and, and Christopher was also referring to this, we're reaching levels of inequality that we haven't seen in 100 years, 120 years, right? If you take a look at the, at the numbers uh, uh, since the end of the 19th century. And so we've got to do something about it because um, uh, technology continues to change and it continues to you know, create uh, two groups of people, people who benefit from it and people who don't benefit from it. And, and this has always been the case with technological change, but now, I mean, it's, it's really hurting. And the, I think business has a role to play in all of this uh, in the sense of, um, well, first of all, being aware of what the consequences are of introducing changes in the work process or this or that. And secondly, uh, I would say realizing that um, you can think about this as a cost that you're imposing on society, right? Uh, yes, you're trying to be more efficient as a business, you're trying to compete, all of that, but you're imposing a cost, meaning that you're getting rid of some workers or you're asking workers to work for less money. And that in the end accumulates and it aggregates to a huge problem, right? Uh, so I'm, I'm very, cons uh, just, just that one, one thought, uh, Christoph, I mean, you're the expert on technology here, but, um, Technological, I mean, you mentioned this earlier, technology by itself doesn't change anything. It's how we use the technology, how we deploy it, how we you know, um, advance other things in life with technology. And I think we're not paying enough attention to the ill effects of it. And look, in every country in the world, most of them there's a gas on, there's a tax on, 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 on fuel, on gasoline. And you use normally that money to repair the roads. So I think that we should be taxing the robots that's a headline here uh, for the journalists, uh, tax the robots and then with that money, help people who are left behind. Because otherwise you get what Christoph said, which is that people then go for extreme political options, either left or right. And I completely agree with him. Most of the support for populism comes from people who are losing out in this new economy, which is knowledge driven, which is technologically driven, right? That they're losing out and therefore then they fall prey to extreme political options. And, and that is really, as you said, I, I really like the word corrosive. It corrodes everything. Right? I think there's another factor uh, that uh, I think we should mention. Yeah. And that's the winner take all nature of, uh, uh, of our capitalistic system. Um, so during COVID, there have been people who lost uh, and the people who have gained are the people who have money to invest. I'm one of them, right? I have, you know, not very much. I, I have invested a little bit of money and I have made money from that. I'm one of the winners, you know, not in a big way of the COVID era. And, you know, that's Thomas Piketty, right? The capitalistic system is such because capital is more fungible uh, that uh, the concentration of wealth has outpaced. So uh, uh, differences in wages actually are not that strong in all countries. Uh, you know, actually in Germany, in Sweden, these are two countries that I know well, wages haven't shifted that much. Wealth has, right? The winner takes all nature of capital accumulation is, uh, is causing, I mean, in the, in the US, I mean, the numbers are so staggering, you know, that, uh, you know, it, it was from 10% of the population uh, owning 90% of the wealth, it's now 1% of the population owning 90, you know, something really staggering. And, and technology and people being displaced doesn't explain that. And in Denmark, you know, they're actually, Denmark has a very, very expensive system uh, where if you lose your job, you get for free, uh, you get offered the possibility of learning something else, right? Automation by itself doesn't destroy people's existence. If you give them a chance to do something else, um, you know, in a way that they can engage, you know, without losing their self-confidence, uh, you, know, you know, then people shift into the next productive sector. Automation itself doesn't destroy the existences of people, right? But capital accumulation does. These are, these are incredibly important issues uh, that we're raising. We, we'd, we'd like to have more time for discussion and debate, but I, I, I'm okay. I, I'm, I lost a seat, but, I, um, but um, I want to give, open up the, the floor for questions in just a few minutes. But before we move on to that, I want to ask the panelists, the deans, what are the implications of these and other wider challenges for business schools in terms of what we teach, who we teach, what we research and who we engage with. And it's a broad, broad area, but with big challenges, climate change, technological change, inequality, we've just, just scratched the surface of them. But what's the role of business schools before we open it up to the audience, both on the floor and via Zoom? Why don't you 
Yeah, it's got a mirror. Let's get, let's get a view from Wharton. Actually, let's get a view from Wharton. Yeah, turn it around. View from Wharton. Actually, I'm going to inflict on you the same medicine, which is that I'm going to leave very little ground for you to cover. So that, uh, Go right ahead. Yeah. But let's see if I succeed at that. So I think uh, the perception uh, in many parts of the world about business schools is that we're, we're part of the problem, that we have contributed to this. I'm talking about the perception. I'm not saying whether I agree with you with that or not, but perceptions matter. And right now, I think business schools have, I think, uh, um, suffered a reputational, um, they face a reputational problem. And this started, in my appreciation, in 2008, 2009, with the previous global financial crisis. And uh, it was a problem that was never really addressed. And then comes now, uh, you know, the crisis over inequality and COVID. And COVID, of course, has been a great accelerator of inequality. It has exacerbated inequality. I mean, we all know this. And uh, Christo was referring to that earlier. So I think what business schools should do is obviously not just engage in window dressing or marketing or um, you know uh, damage control. Uh, I think uh, that's uh, not enough. Uh, I don't think it's enough either to say, oh, we're going to offer an elective on these issues. I think uh, perhaps uh, the entire experience, the, the entire learning experience, and by that I'm not just saying the curriculum or the classes that everybody has to take. But the entire learning experience perhaps uh, needs to be, with your help, reorganized, right, in such a way that these issues are part of everybody's uh, approach to every problem, whether it's a marketing problem or a finance problem or accounting problem or whatever it is. So I think it's something that, and again, it's not just the curriculum itself. I think it has to be the, the, the entire learning experience, right, so that, in other words, we create a community of learners which is not only aware of these issues but also who is willing to act on them as future business leaders so that would be my approach um so no no amount of damage control i think we business schools have tried to i'm, I'm not referring obviously specifically to cambridge judge business school but rather just in general right i don't think that's the way to go it's not a pr problem i think it is something about has something to do with the kind of community of learners that we want to create and once again with your help or now um, I understand most of you are graduating uh, with your help as alumni, uh, but also with the help of current students. I think that's the, really the only way to go. So it's not a patch here, a patch there, uh, you know, piecemeal solution after piecemeal solution, but rather a more holistic approach to it. Because once again, we are perceived, and perhaps there's good reasons for that, as being part of the problem. Not, and I think we have to become part of the solution. I think it's so important to, uh, for leadership, it's so important to understand context. That's always been the case with regard to technology, your technology, your markets, your um, uh, people. But that context now on the global scale that we've been talking about is so utterly important that there can't be any leeway to say, what's the relevance of this? Why am I required to look at these themes that we've uh, that we've identified. So I think there is something about the context of the curriculum. I was also thinking about um, sort of three dimensions. And I think we need to put more emphasis upon the dimension of time. And we have to really make sure that we're identifying the short term, the medium and the long term, and make it legitimate to think about the focus in each of those areas. So I say, let's look a bit more emphasis upon time. Let's take that other it's essential dimension, which is space, which is geography, um, understanding the community in context, in the spaces in which they are, because in a global world, um, understanding what it's like to um, live in northern India, understanding what it's like to live in Central America, understanding what it's like to live in the north of England rather than the south of England. It's absolutely essential that we really understand what is building communities around the world. And so I think space is my next dimension. And if you look at business school curriculums, you hardly ever see time and space, but I think they're important. And the other thing is humanity, is people. It's the ethics and the purpose and the values that uh, we've been talking about, which I, I think that, and Cambridge Judge Business School, I can say as a really old grandma to it, that has always been a sense of purpose and making a difference. 
to, to really use our capacities and our skills to make a difference to our businesses, to our charities and to the world. And I think that's got to really shine through. Um, mistakes will be made, but I think time, space, people, and above all, the idea of, um, uh, of working to a purpose with all the efficiencies, all the excellence, all the stakeholders, everything we learn put into that. Okay, uh, I'll tell you a little story. Uh, when I was um, at, uh, at INSEAD, I was a professor at INSEAD in France for a long time. And uh, around maybe 2000, um, I had uh, a colleague who was teaching financial accounting, uh, you know, to students as well as an executive education. And he was a star, superstar. And he would go into the class and he would say to people, there's no debate about this. I don't want any one of you to even dare to contradict me on this. It's all about shareholder value. And if you give me any other bullshit, then you're wrong. And this is what we're now discussing. Uh, and that's it, okay? And he just browbeat people into the ideology, what it's all about, okay? And this was really powerful. People walked out of this going like, whoa. They didn't forget it, that's for sure. And that's what we've done, you know, and that is, you know, of course, what you said earlier, we were part of the problem. So what does, a, you know, what do we give you in terms of teaching? We give you the capability to look holistically at managing an organization for performance, right? And that's what you learn in an MBA, in an EMBA, okay? That's not gonna change. And what's not gonna change either is that you will go then into different contexts where you will be driven by the pressures of your environment, right? And that is always true. Uh, you know, even people who come from the humanities or from philosophy uh, and they go into companies, they are under certain pressures and their behavior conforms to those pressures. However, by what we tell you and what we show you as opportunities, we give you legitimacy to think in certain ways. And in the past, the legitimacy was it's about ownership and shareholder value. And if you think about something else, you're a sissy. And that was devastating, right? And that had gave legitimacy to the people who pulled the government and the people and the entire economy over the table in order to, in order to line their pockets. And that is the responsibility of business schools now, you know, to give you the legitimacy to think broader than shareholder value, to remind yourselves that there are responsibilities that businesses have in the context of their societies, you know, to take into account the contexts, you know, you, you walk out of here with the legitimacy of thinking, you know, of a business in certain ways. And you will never forget that. And even though you are in certain contexts where you're pushed to behave in certain ways, once you have learned that thinking, you can revert and you, you can behave responsibly, more broadly, in a broader interest, not just selfish. Um, and that capability of thinking in various ways, that's the core of what you are hopefully getting when you walk out of here. And what business schools, you know, in the general context of neoclassical economics that everybody, you know, including governments who were talking about, we need to obliterate ourselves because of neoclassical economics. Business schools weren't the only ones who did that, right? But certainly business schools did this, right? And now, um, you know, the capability to say, we have a responsibility, we are in a context, uh, and it's more than just making profits, but we are part of a community. This is something that you shouldn't forget no matter under which pressures you are in the job that you're working in later. Thank you, thank you, thank you all the deans, and thank you, Christoph. And great to end on, on the limitations of neoclassical economics. It's a, it's a high point, for, a high point to hear from me. But, but what, what we now is got some opportunities for questions. And for, we, there are um, some microphones going around. So I'm gonna take a question from over here, first of all, and uh, please speak into the microphone. Hey, hello. Thank you so much for the sharing, especially the innovative uh, aspect. It's very good. So two questions. So the first one is like uh, Professor uh, Michael mentioned, climate change has been an out long outstanding issue for a while. One of the reasons 
uh, can be the short-term profit focus versus the long-term impact focus. So my question is like, how do we manage the differences on like short-term focus and long-term focus in the decision-making process? And the second question is related to, I mean, as a group of MBA business, uh, MBA business school student, what should we do differently starting from today to like, you know, after we knowing the impact that we can make? So yeah, that is my question. Thank you. Two questions on the short term versus the long term. And what should they be doing as MBA students? You were addressing us. The first one was short or long term. It, it was it was how we was it how we get the balance between short term and long term. Is that right? Yeah. 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 And what was the second one? What, what, what you can do as MBA students, was that right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I'll answer the first one on short and long term from the point of view of being on uh, my most recent experience, which is being on boards of companies. And there I think um, it is so easy to be driven by the short term because we're all, all the directors are very, very focused on, on what the figures are showing us. And I think when you construct the agenda and when there's a discussion between the chair and the chief executive, if you don't have um, a strategic subject and you don't have a regular review of what the strategy is, then you will be driven down a rabbit hole in the short term. So it's funnily enough, just constructing the agenda of a board over a year and over two years can actually make sure that at the top of the company, the, um, the, the short and the long term is, is um, uh, paid attention to. I think the, also you can look at remuneration and you can see how remuneration is often driven a very short term view as well as the share price. On the other hand, I have been in a boardroom where you're looking and you're seeing your share price drop and you're, um, Absolutely, you're not just focused on the next quarter, you're focused on the next hour. And I think that we should understand <laughs> that that is a, a sort of viscerally difficult situation uh, in which to be. So I don't think the looking at the long term means you don't look at the short term. You absolutely have got to do both. You could do that with the agenda. I also favor very much having, if your company is big enough, having um, horizon scanning um, group, having make sure that you're involving other people in the company, not just those at the top, in actually looking um, into the horizon for your company. And that could affect mergers and acquisitions, it can affect new markets, um, and it can affect very, very much how you're approaching the issue of global markets um, and globalization and inequality. But if you don't structure that in, it sure is anything is squeezed out. So I think there are techniques you can use. Um, what does MBA students, what does MBA students can you do? I think you can always ask yourself, what's the purpose? What's the purpose of this organization? And what's my purpose in it? And am I um, going ahead and fulfilling that purpose? And if you can't answer that, if you said the pub is the best innovation, you can't answer that in the pub when someone says, well, what do you do? If you can't answer it in terms of what your identity is and the purpose of, of the organization you're with, I think you should look again and think, do I really belong here? Should I go somewhere where I can really articulate a purpose which is right for me? So I, 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 I fully agree. Um, some of you may remember, um, you know, when I, uh, when I give a speech to, uh, you know, prospective students, uh, and I say, uh, you know, you think you're coming here to turbocharge your career, which is true. Uh, but really, what you should be doing is ask yourself, uh, what would I look, what would I like to look back to 30 years from now toward the end of my career and be proud of and go for that. Uh, don't go for the biggest salary, go for something, um, you know, that uh, you believe uh, is something that 30 years from now, you can look back to and say, you know, I did something that I can still say now, you know, at least it was a good attempt. It may not have worked, but I'm proud of it. You know, which is what you just said in different words. You know, vote with your feet uh, and, uh, you know, don't just go for the seductive, uh, uh, you know, check that you get in your first month uh, because that's not going to be the future. Mara, do you want to Quick thing, uh, avoid group think. As MBA students, uh, you're going to be leading a team if you ever become a CEO, you're going to have a team there. You need to balance the short term and the, and the long term. I mean, you know, both are, you know, the two sides of the same coin, really. 
but don't hire people for your team who think exactly the way you think, because then you're not going to be challenged. Uh, I think it's, uh, as you know, there's a ton of research indicating that it's a really bad idea to do that. Uh, so I would say, uh, you know, think very carefully about whom you bring to your team. If you bring people who all of them think like you do, I don't think you're going to be as successful, right? As if you uh, try to uh, promote a little bit more diversity of views. And that I think translates <laughs> you know, quite directly into this issue of uh, long-term versus, versus short-run. So that would be my piece of advice. Great, thank you. We have some questions via Zoom. Comrade Shua, the executive director of the MBA has got those. So for via Zoom, Comrade? Yes, we've got a few questions on Zoom. But before that, I just want to let you know that there's a bit of a, a controversial discussion, I'd say, between two members of our faculty on the chat about the difference between income and wealth inequality. So shout out to Pedro and Kamal. I'll leave you to think who's on which side of that. Yeah. Um, the first question is from another member of the faculty, Kamia, who asks, what about developing and emerging economies where people are living on a few US dollars per day? How should they finance the transition to a low carbon and sustainable future? I'll, I'll repeat that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, what about developing and emerging economies? where people are living on a few US dollars per day, how should they finance this transition to a low carbon and sustainable future? Well, they can, right? You know, they're, they're, you know it's, the, it's the captains of industry and the captains of, uh, you know, who are structuring the economic system who need to give them an environment where they can do it. You, you can't ask people who are living on, uh, you know, on $2.80 per day, uh, to make sacrifices, uh, they're not in the position to do so. That needs to be shouldered by the people who are in, uh, who can influence the structure of the economic system in which they work. It may well yeah. be international organizations who do and that though, because it, these countries may be incredibly poor, may not have the resources to invest yeah. in. But uh, I, I would be very careful about making an assumption that because communities are very poor, they don't have some really brilliant ideas that can be right, innovated yeah, and, and enabled a more um, uh, energy efficient system. And I think that a sort of rather paternalistic idea that it's either the international agencies in the, in the global north or um, individual business leaders who are going to solve those problems, I think is wrong. It's not only, uh, to my mind, um, arrogant, um, but it also won't deliver. I mean, what we know about buying into um, uh, a different way of working, you can facilitate, um, but if you don't get local leadership, then um, it probably won't work. And during my time in which I was a, a director of Oxfam International, um, not Oxfam International, Oxfam GB, but we did a lot of international work where we, we could fund, we could provide expertise, we could facilitate. The successes came in terms of sustainable, uh, for example, horticulture, enabling greater say for women, um, uh, enabling health and education all came because the facilitation came to enable community development and uh, community uh, pride, and then you can begin to um, make skills. So I think that the solutions lie with, with, uh, within the communities. And what we have to do in the global north as businesses or as charities is to help facilitate, but above all to listen and to understand that we won't necessarily have those solutions. We've got lots of things, we've got resources, we've got ideas um, and so on, but it, no longer is it that we go there with the solutions. Now let's go to the next question because this is what I have said. I mean, it's uh, I completely I'm, I'm, agree. I'm gonna take a, what I'm going to do is take a couple of questions from the floor and perhaps one from Zoom. Can I get a couple of um, microphones over here? And there's one at the front as well, just just in the middle row here. Is so keep, to take off the mask just for the yeah. If you could take off the mask for the question I, only, and then put it back. I, I can I just I can't understand you when you're behind your mask. And, and, and keep, keep, keep the questions short and snappy. We're running out of time because of bad sharing. Uh, but so, so, so it's just one here. Uh, thank you, Deans, for that discussion. Uh, my, my question is around the uh, sustainability and uh, ESG initiatives or uh, inter-business. So I wanted to ask whether you think uh, increased uh, sustainability initiatives are actually 
reducing the return on investment, but we're okay with that. We're accepting of that because we're looking at a triple bottom line or similar metric. Or do we think there's going to be a, a value add to the business itself by adopting such uh, initiatives? Okay, so we'll just hold that question there. I'll take, but take one maybe, more. Yeah, maybe, so only one of us. maybe only one of us. Yeah. I can answer this. Answer, well, Mara, Mara answer let, me answer, let me answer the question. Let me answer from my point on, on green investment. So this already came up. Is uh, Do we only uh, do things if the business case demonstrates that it's good for the business or not? And I think we're going back to the issue of short term versus long term. And we're going back to the issue of the, what is the source of responsibility of business in all of this? And I think we need to rise above that uh, narrow, uh, you know, metric of uh, whether the business case can be made or not. If you can make it, great. But I don't think that's going to be enough for overcoming some of the really serious issues uh, that we're confronting. Uh, and uh, therefore, yes, there is a trade-off, and maybe companies should do the right thing and uh, absorb some of the, you know, like accept um, uh, smaller returns in exchange for, and I put quotes around that, doing the right thing in terms of the, some of these issues. Otherwise, I don't think how we're going to overcome them. And the clock is ticking. That's the other issue, right? The clock is ticking. And there are companies that are, I think, accepting that trade-off and, um, and um, you know, uh, accepting uh, lower returns. And uh, by the way, I think uh, anything that is going on in terms of uh, social impact investing or, uh, you know, all of these new movements in stock markets and investing, all of that, I think that's also great. And it addresses the other issue that uh, Christoph um, raised, which was the uh, shareholder-centered view, right? And whether we need to at least call into question the assumptions in that model, right? I just add that it's quite likely that the more non-financial reporting is required, the more uh, people will be looking at aspects of, uh, if you like, the non-immediate financial as well. I mean, it can't be an alternative, but it's as well. And I think, you know, social impact, environmental impact, assessments on infrastructure and so on, um, are, all need to be seriously taken into account. Question down here at the you uh, mentioned uh, inequality is one of the biggest challenges and um, one linked area of that which is growing particularly in this country is inequality between the old and the young and uh, business schools with their focus on the young are they doing enough to address this area great question yeah, I don't know. I'm an old person, but I do. <laughs> I, yeah. um, I, I mean, I think it's very complicated, really, because if you look at COVID, um, there is, was a lot of feeling, and I have some sympathy with this, that, that really the old were, were um, made more special uh, than the young, and um, many of the negative consequences are going to be held by the by the young were you suggesting that the inequality which way were you suggesting the inequality was going with regard to age uh, yeah yeah, yeah. Can, I, can i add one thing don't take it for granted that in the future only people in your age group are going to be coming to study um, I think that may also be an assumption that doesn't hold in the future. Because we're living longer and longer and longer, technology changes everything. I think in the future, there's a good chance that people will go back to school several times, not just once. So I'm, I'm just saying, don't, don't take it for granted. Uh, I'm not in no way advancing any ideas about the future of the school in saying this. All I'm saying is that uh, that's an assumption that has held for the last 150 years. I don't know whether it will hold for the future. We've had compulsory schooling for 150 years in the world, beginning in places like Germany. Uh, I don't know whether, you know, only young people will learn in the future, right? Okay. You see what I'm saying, right? I think the other thing we've got to look at is sort of who's holding that wealth for the older people. And we could look at the role of pension funds as investors and so on. So it's, it's, not, a, it's not a straightforward matter, although I do think that the particular um, older group um, benef benefited have benefited a lot in this country, but to me, to me, the some of the inequalities um, on race, on uh, ethnicity, on disability, um, and on gender are equally as important, if not more important. And I think that we that says something about how we value people, um, and. Uh, we've got to address that. Um, I, I'll say one more thing. Um, there is a debate about this in Germany at the moment about uh, pension age. 
Um, and a, a, a prominent politician said, look, this is just an accounting question. Uh, when people get older, then they have to work longer uh, because if you don't maintain a certain percentage of your lifetime on average, of course, you know, that you can go on pension, then, uh, uh, you know, then the number of people who are retired balloons and then uh, it becomes a huge burden, you know, on young people. And uh, of course, this person was then met with the appropriate uproar and uh, outrage and, you know, but there's something to this, right? They, uh, you can't, uh, you know, retire everybody at 55 and then all of a sudden half of the population lives, uh, you know, at the cost of the other half of the population. Everybody can understand, uh, you know, that that's not possible. So, uh, you know, there are some, you know, straightforward directional answers, you know, to this problem, uh, right? To some of the other inequalities, it's much less, you know, much, uh, you know, less clear what one could do. We, we are running out of time, so I would love to take some more questions, but we're running out of time. So I'm sorry, just, we're just running out of time. It's great that there's lots of questions. It's just that we uh, just haven't got enough time. So I just want to leave the last minute or two for some reflections, final reflections from the panel. Are, are you optimistic about the future? I know Marrow is because I've read your book, but are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future? So I'm a pessimist, but then I'm an economist. It's come to the job. Optimistic. Realistic. So, so you, you're really, so you're really, you're optimistic about the future, um, Sandra, Christoph. I'm, I'm always optimistic, and uh, yeah, I'm always optimistic. I think that we've got to be really careful, and we've got to examine our assumptions much more carefully. We want everyone to be much more curious, um, and we want people to be asking lots of questions rather than rushing to solutions. Um, but I, um, I am by nature an optimist. Christoph, optimist. Uh, I would say I'm worried. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I'm looking around and I see that we are not prioritizing what we need to prioritize at all levels, you know, from governments to organizations. And I'm worried. I, you know, I, I don't want to go as far as saying I'm, I'm pessimistic. You know, I'm, I, I, I try to look at things, uh, you know, with an entrepreneur uh, mindset. Uh, but uh, uh, what I see at the moment doesn't fulfill me. Uh, with great confidence. Okay, so we've got a, so we have a spectrum of views there, but I think we probably all agreed that business schools will be part of this solution and certainly not part Definitely. of the problem. Uh, and certainly that judge business school and you, you know, our major product really at the people who graduate from us, you will be helping to solve these global problems. So I particularly like to wrap up now by thanking our three speakers, Professor Christoph Locke, Professor Dame Sandra Dawson and Professor Maro Bien. So let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Okay. Just, just finally, thank, thank, you. thank you for everybody who joined us here physically in the Cambridge Union. Thanks for everybody who joined us either via Zoom or on YouTube. And if you joined us by Zoom or YouTube, we hope to see you soon back in Cambridge. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.